talking to John Morris, who is the production coordinator of Woodstock. And basically, the main thing that I wanted to talk to you, Mr. Morris, about was what it took to get the band lined up for Woodstock. That had to be a massive undertaking. Well, it's a little easier in those days. Uh, part of the reason that I was working with Woodstock is that I'd run the film more East for Bill Graham for a while, so I knew most of the managers and most of the agents. Uh, some of them were very easy. There were one or two, you know, there were one or two uh, situations which were pretty. Peter Townsend, who uh, was not was going to be, well, they were not. They turned down the offer two or three times, mm -hmm. and uh, Frank Barcelona, who was their agent, who still is their agent. Uh, was a real good friend. We got Peter over to dinner at Frank's house at about 6 o'clock and fed him this great spaghetti dinner and started talking to him about Woodstock kept going and going. And finally at 5 o'clock in the morning, Peter was huddled in the corner saying, okay, 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 I'll come back, I'll play it, I'll do it, I'll do it. But I want 15 grand. And I sort of smiled at him and said, I've only got 11 left in the budget. And so they did it for 11000 Okay, and, and that was also in conjunction with the fact that uh, their tour had ended like two weeks prior to that, and they were coming back to do a show for Bill Graham? Right, they were playing for Graham at, uh, up in Tanglewood, and uh, Peter didn't like outdoor shows. He didn't really want to do it, and we persuaded him that if he was coming in to do one, he might as well stay over a week and do the other one. And uh, that was that was what took almost 11 hours to, to talk him into. Yeah, that must have been that must have been a rather intense situation. With a look um, on his face when I said I've only got 11, <laughs> like you know, oh no, because that was it. He was the last. They were the last act we bought, mm -hmm. and that was all we had left. They actually, I think, on the Live at Leeds uh, album. I know in England, I don't know about here, but they printed it on as part of the album. The contract right there. I think that might have been uh, an internal, like an insert sort of thing. Yeah, I think it yeah. was. It was a chest sleeve thing or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, what about uh, one of the, the groups that um, seems to have caused a lot of consternation was Jimi Hendrix and his group. I guess that it took quite a bit of negotiating and things and de deciding um, as to whether or not to bring him in. Well, it was, I mean, not, you mean to book him on the show? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, we wanted him really badly because we thought he was, I mean, that he was going, he was at that point nearing a real high point in his career. And as far as the draw was concerned, he was really, really worth it. Uh, the consternation or the, the confusion was that Jimmy wanted to perform his two bands. And he had his band, the Gypsies, and he had... Uh, he... We did two contracts. Actually, he was paid two, you know, on two separate contracts. And the total, I think, was 35 grand, which, you know, is, is nothing these days. Mm -hmm. It's the biggest act there. And in fact, uh, he had a guy named Mike Jeffries, who was his manager, who had a reputation of being real hard, I mean, real tough to deal with. And Mike died, actually, uh, oh, I think he was on a plane crash. Uh, but Michael was, in fact, everything but his reputation. He was as cooperative. He kept Jimmy literally driving around in circles for two days until we brought him in. I mean, Hendrix's appearance timing at Woodstock was not planned. It was one of those fateful accidents. Uh, but, and it wasn't that he was necessarily going to close the show. In the end, he was, I think, supposed to play a rhythm on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. And we just couldn't get him in, and it wasn't ready. And Mike was about as cooperative as he could possibly be. And this is a guy who had a reputation with everybody in the business. And I dealt with him before as being a real bad um, But he did exactly the opposite. I mean, he saw what the condition was. He worked with us, and he kept it going. And, uh, Get Jimmy out there, you know, literally like running like a running around on the end of a string. Uh, kept moving hotels and kept moving places, and finally, in the end, brought him in. And none of us knew uh, that he was going to do the Star Spangled Banner thing. Of course, it was the, probably the single most important piece of music out of it. Mm -hmm. um, Iron Butterfly. There are some interesting stories about them. Well, this I don't think there's anything interesting about Iron Butterfly. Um, not one of the bands that I booked. Uh, we got a telegram from them at the point that the festival was already on saying, you will send us, this is before faxes, you know, there, is, there actually was a life before faxes. <laughs> and we got this telegram saying, you will send, we will arrive at LaGuardia Airport, you will send helicopter, helicopter will pick us up, we will arrive, the minute we arrive, we will go on stage, we will perform, we will get in helicopter, we will fly back to LaGuardia, we will leave. 
And I read this, and I admit that I was, my, my feelings were covered by the fact that I didn't like Firefly anyway. And so I got on the, uh, well, since you're on the air, I have to be careful also, but I got on with a Western Union operator, and between the two of us, we figured out how to send the message to the two words that you cannot send, that Country Joe, one of which Country Joe used, uh, to them, which we did. And I think it uh, was something like Fuchsia you or something like that, <laughs> but it, it, the message got across, we never heard another word. What I heard was that they were booked and signed, and then they got stuck at the airport. They refused to come from the airport without that support, we told them to forget it. Not to bother to come. It was again. It was an attitude. It was a management attitude thing. You know, we are God. We are this. We are. You must do this. And we just at that point, if you've got, you know, if you've hired sixteen private helicopters and you've got a half a million people and you're worried about, you know, getting them, uh, keeping them supplied and happy and you know, sunstroke and cut feet and all the rest of it, uh, and some band starts playing attitude on you, uh, at that point, especially if you don't like the band, it's really easy to say mm-hmm, you yeah. and. Uh, uh, the, the operator at Western Union, God Lover, was wonderful. We worked out a real great way of doing it. I can't remember exactly how it did, but it was, it was I think we did a sentence where the, the F was fuchsia, and then we did each one, but if you read it up and down, you got the message. Because Western Union cannot send that. But we did. We figured out a way. Tim Hart had uh, insisted on specifically not going out first. Yeah. Um, what was the circumstance around that, and, and how did he finally get worked into the lineup? Because I understand there were a lot of lineup changes going on, in particular on the first day. Well, the lineup changes were, I mean, the lineup was out the window, purely and simply because there weren't acts there. I mean, Richie went on because Richie was there, and he was physically there, and it was literally, Richie, uh, I hate to ask you to do this, but will you please? Uh, there's nobody here. We're an hour or so after we should have started. I can't get anybody else in. You know, will you do it? And Richie said, yeah. And then it was Richie, keep playing. Because we haven't got anybody else. Richie, keep playing. <laughs> keep playing because we haven't got anybody else. And uh, that's how Freedom got got invented. I mean, he literally did the song right there in front of everybody else because we kept saying, keep playing, keep playing, keep playing. We haven't got anybody else. Joe McDonald went and did the first single performance he'd ever done because he and I had actually discussed it. He and Bill Belmont, his manager, who was working with us, had discussed it when he was in, um, when we were, we'd been in Europe a few months before about thinking about doing a solo thing. And he was there by himself just watching, sitting on the side of the stage. And uh, he said, uh, I suddenly looked around and said to Belmont, you think we can talk him into it? He said, I don't know. So we did. We went and tried to we talked him into it. We shoved him out on stage. He performed. There, there was a little bit during that segment, too, of um, having to try and find equipment. He was trying to stop. <laughs> yes, he wanted, a, he wanted a capo to clamp on the end of the guitar. And uh, I thought he said a capo on it. I couldn't figure out why the hell you know, he wanted this uh, neutered chicken. What's that what he was talking about? Until Jerry Garcia, who happened to be wandering around also. No, man, he wants a capo. Here, you take mine. <laughs> John Sebastian was another one of those performers that down, just happened to be there. Walked down the street, dressed in head to toe, from, in tie-dyes with, a, with his guitar case. And I was like, hi, great to see you, wonderful. You know, sorry we never called you before. Get on stage. Whoop, bang. Yeah, I mean, that's, the whole schedule thing was out the window because there was no way we could bring people in the way that we had planned it. Um, interesting story about Santana and what those... Eventually led into their being their first really major appearance. Yeah, I've seen Santana in um, in the old Fillmore in San Francisco. Actually, it was the Carousel Ballroom in Fillmore, and I had been blown away by them. I just had thought they were one of the most dynamic, exciting things I'd ever seen. And actually, it was quite good friends with Jack Holzman who ran Elektra Records and called Jack up and said, "You ought to come by." Uh, in the end, Clive Davis got there first, and they signed with CBS. And Jack, for years, kept saying, boy, were you right. Boy, were you right. Now, there are a couple I've been really wrong on, <laughs> but, uh, no, that was why we booked them. I'd seen them, and they were wonderful. And we got them real cheap, $2,500. And, and, of course, they went out to become, in, in a lot of people's opinions, one of the most appreciated, one of the biggest highlights of the show. Oh, yeah. Oh, and it was Sean Anna, who were managed by a wonderful man named Eddie Goodgold probably knows more about 50s music than anybody in the face of the earth. Uh, and 
with them, they were booked, again, because we'd seen them and everybody was, thought they were going to be something. And Ed was so upset about having to go on as the sun came up. And the way it comes off in the film, I mean, it made their career. Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, there were lots of little accidents. And it's one of those things, if you believe in karma, it's one of those things, the guys who leaned into it, the guys who gave, the guys who... who out, put themselves out. Sebastian, Sebastian's career was nowhere at that point. Uh, Santana, big career. Cocker, who got caught in the middle of the storm. Uh, Sha Na Na. You know, some of those bands uh, just they had entire changes in their lives because of their own generosity and the way that they worked with us and made it happen. Mm-hmm. And by the same token, there were a number of other acts there that, on the bad side of things, had actually read it poor performances. And I understand that Janis Joplin was one of them. Janis's, Janis's show was not that great. Uh, but then that's compared to Janis's regular shows, which were pretty good. She was not in great shape. Mm-hmm. It didn't really work. Uh, that happened. No, that happens. I've seen a lot of performance go out and just, you know, it didn't work that night. And it's one thing that, why do you just don't understand that a lot? It's like, I used to tour with the airplane a long time ago, and I can remember having a big argument with Grace when she suddenly decided she would never sing White Rabbit again. And her argument, which was totally valid, was, I'm sick of this. I have been singing it, you know, 150, 200 nights for the last three years. I'm bored to death with it. And that's absolutely true. And if you get bored to death with it, and if it goes off, and it doesn't work, and you can't perform it well, uh, because you're just sick to death with it, the audience sometimes doesn't understand any more than give me a replication of the album. Mm-hmm. You know, give it, do it for me now. So Janice went out on stage that night, and it didn't work. It was bad show. That's, you know, it happens. It is not, you know, if God gives you a talent, that's one thing. He doesn't necessarily give you the ability to do exactly the same thing with exactly the same energy and have it really work. I mean, I've seen Janice, first show that I ever did with Janice, which was the first one she did in New York, the old Yiddish Anderson Theater, uh, when we brought her in before there was a film Maurice. She was terrified. She was so scared. They never done anything in the East. The rest of it. She went out on stage and I think sang for two hours. I mean, the audience would not let her go. Mm-hmm. That's one of the most exciting shows I've ever seen. So if she did a bummer at one other place, they figure they all equal out well or not. Yeah, and of course, you walk out on stage and you look out into the sea of humanity. And, and I understand that Grace also was somewhat... Uh, stage shy um, after seeing all those people and uh, a couple other people as well just had this intense reaction to all those people because nobody had seen that many people in one place before no and it was a, just a phenomenal event all the way around um, the Grateful Dead they uh, were asked specifically to extend their set uh, because they were well known for doing that and I understand that uh, you were, you were trying to supply as much music to the kids as possible so they weren't just wandering around, wandering to the listen thing. Well, it was, especially on the Saturday and Sunday nights, uh, we switched over to the idea that it was much better to keep it going and to keep everybody, because you had so many people. Uh, it wasn't a matter of wandering around. Wandering around was pretty hard. The idea on the Sunday, on the last night, which I think is a fairly good philosophy in a similar situation, uh, would use it just about anywhere, is that unless the thing is going to end early enough so that everybody can leave and go home with some kind of lighting, it is much safer uh, that you go through the night until the sun comes up. Because you do two things. One, everybody's worn out. So home is the only direction that anybody's thinking about. And the other is that just as far as traffic and movement and everything else, you can see where you're going. So that was part of that. Hoffman in the Who. There are a number of different stories as to what actually occurred on the stage that night. Well, Abby, God rest his soul, because he was a good friend. Uh, I think Abby's remembrance of it is, or the one in the book, is incorrect. Uh, but it was the one he had. Uh, I was sitting next to Mike with Abby on the stage. Mike had brought him up, and uh, he did want to go make the John Clear speech. Uh, and he was very bummed 
asked about it, and he was probably wound up on something. But he had done, actually, he was upset with me because I had thanked him publicly from the stage, saying what a wonderful job he's been doing helping people in the trip tent and the rest of it. And he looked at me and said, what are you trying to do? Ruin my entire reputation? Uh, and I said, no, you just, you've been, you know, you've really put out, and you've really helped, and you didn't have to be in it. Maybe it's not your reputation, but it is the way you do things. Because I think everything that Abby always did was, was really at a positive basis. Uh, Abby was not a terror down. Abby was a builder. Uh, I did get to be as old as I am to remember Al Shack, who was called the Clown Prince of Baseball. And I always thought that, that Abby was the Clown Prince of the Revolution. He was, he was, he kept it funny. He kept it interesting. He was imaginative as all hell. Uh, he once planted trees down the middle of 8th Street in New York, um, St. Mark's Place. And, um, cops came and arrested him, and Joe Fink, who was the head of the precinct down there, was really great, and just said, okay, Abby, get in the car. And Abby got in the car, and they got down the precinct station, and all the crowd had run down the precinct station. They were outside yelling, maybe, you know, 150, 200 people yelling, free, Abby, free, Abby. And Joe said, you go. And he said, what do you mean? You arrested me. And Joe said, no, I didn't arrest you. I drove up in my squad car. You had trees parked down the middle of the street. This traffic blocked up all across half of Manhattan. And all I said was, okay, Abby, into the car. You got up and got in the car. I gave you a ride down here. You can go now. And Abby said, wait a minute, you can't do that. They'll, they'll, you know, I'll be in real trouble. Joe said, well, got you this time, Abby. So Abby kicked in his trophy case and Joe arrested him. <laughs> Everybody saved face. Abby knew he'd been done in by the cop and the cop got his some broken glass. Abby did bring the money back and replace the glass. But that was the kind of guy he was. I, and Townsend didn't know who it was. It had nothing to do. It had no awareness of the Sinclair thing or anything else. He just saw somebody charging, you know, and being in his way and being on the stage. And Peter has had that happen enough times. I mean, Frank Zappa was playing for me in London. And some guy charged up and hit him and knocked him into the orchestra pit and smashed his leg and put him in a hospital for six or eight months. And Frank has one leg that's a little bit shorter than the other since then. Peter was reacting in self-defense. He thought from a condition he was not unfamiliar with. So, and, and uh, yeah, it's one of those things, that that's my interpretation of it. That's what I thought. I was in a situation with Peter years later, again in London, when I at the Rainbow Theater, where uh, they opened the theater for me. And on the opening night, uh, after the show, they did a wonderful show. Moody, Steve Moody, hired a whole bunch of can-can uh, -can girls. And his entrance was at the end of the can-can line, dressed up in the costume, sat there and played the, kind of the whole set on the drums of the can-can costume after having come on with about six or seven beautiful girls doing a kitchen line. But uh, after the show, I was, I thought everybody was out of the theater, and I was driving, starting to drive home, and I drove by the side, and a whole set of windows came smashing out. Because Peter had thrown a chair through him, and I went in, and Peter was still there, and I went to the matter, I said, what's the matter? He said, I think somebody spiked me. And he was all really upset. We stayed, I mean, I don't know to this day whether they did or didn't, but I stayed with him for three or four hours before we finally got him, calmed down and went home. Sure, if you're a musician of his class and you're somebody that, and all of a sudden, bang, your whole, you know, your whole equilibrium goes to pieces. Nobody has the right to do that to anybody. Right. Okay. Um, basically, there, I guess, the last question would be, what would you consider to be your fondest memory of the, uh, the weekend? Oh, that would be hard. I would say it's easier to say to pick one thing, I mean, it would be waking up and, I mean, because I'd finally lay down after I got into the on stage and waking up and hearing the Star Spangled Banner that started. Uh, and I realized it was over and that it was done, that we had made it. And if there had not been, there been no disaster. It was, it, it was like, in a way, it was like being in a, a batting cage with a pitching machine and things gone crazy and just keep throwing them at you. And, um, we managed to field them. We managed to hit them out and get them, get, you know, keep the whole thing going. I would say if you had to pick one thing, I'd say the, the entire event. I mean, it's 20 years later now. Um, it was, you know, it was a major event in the sociological history of this country. It meant a lot of things to a lot of people, and it still does. We have taken part in it, we've been part of it. Um, and it has affected my life and everybody else's life who was involved in it. Uh, so I'd say it's hard to pick one thing. I mean, I could probably go on for two days about, you know, this was this or that was that, and uh, things that, that I 
remember are the things that have affected me. I think the overall thing would be, in retrospect, looking back 20 years later, I'm exceedingly proud of having been there. Uh, I'm very pleased with a party recently in New York where a lot of people I haven't seen in a long time. Uh, I'm very proud to have been one of the people of a great many people who found themselves in a situation that would have swallowed up an awful lot of other people and who didn't, and it didn't, and who did consistent, constant, uh, under consistent, constant pressure, kept going, and made things work, and cared only about one thing, and that was that uh, there were a lot of people here, and we had to deal with them as best we could, and to keep them as comfortable and as safe as we could, and that we had to complete what we said we were going to do, and that it worked out that way. And you did a wonderful job of it in a very short space of time. It took six months to put the whole thing on. And uh, it's something that has gone down in history and, and will live in history, I think, is, is one of the, the biggest feats of the modern, year, the modern age. Well, if I don't have to do it again tomorrow, it's okay. <laughs> Mr. Morris, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to, to do the interview with me. It's been a real pleasure talking to you.